All right, welcome back everyone. This is the Hoplite channel. Uh, you are clicking on this video because the title, as you saw, is Samurai Lit Takawan Soho Part 3. So uh, we conclude now the um, three-part series for the Zen uh, Buddha monk Takawan Soho. And um, I have decided to um, maybe talk a little bit more about uh, Takawan's life towards the end and what the final part of his book, The Unfettered Mind, uh, had uh, in store for the reader in the Annals of the Sword Tai. And that um, this, this final book, even though it's considered to be perhaps um, the more enigmatic part of this work, is still very, extremely valuable uh, for the uh, student of Bushido and for people uh, learning the samurai's ways uh, and how Zen Buddhism um, used the uh, concept of conscience and enlightenment and in questioning all things and in never having that abiding mind that would rest in one place uh, would be uh, the, the life's work of a samurai just as it was um, a Zen uh, Buddhist monk uh, in their individual works and how uh, this, this never ceasing to come to rest in terms of the mind uh, was the only way in which someone could proceed in the way uh, of Bushido or, or Zen. And um, that was the, uh, the main theme of Immovable Wisdom, which was the first book, um, that the abiding place of the mind is where uh, minds go to stagnate. And stagnation uh, in nature uh, is simply the first state of decay. But um, in the Annals of the Sword Tai, he explains further about how you can use your conscience, as every man can, uh, as a sword uh, to carry with you through life, um, and how the immovable wisdom uh, with your mind is something that uh, neither heaven nor earth uh, can parry or break. And I'll cover that here in a moment. But let's talk uh, further about Takawan Soho, uh, the man, before we get to uh, the unfettered mind uh, excerpts. So we know that he began religious study at the age of 10. Uh, and, you know, this was quite young. I mean, uh, for children nowadays to be 10 years old, learning about, you know, Zen Buddhism and religion, it's very deep. Uh, you know, you're, these kids at this age, you know, they're still learning, you know, math and science and social studies and what have you things that are more immediate in the, in the tense of uh, human interaction as a society. But for uh, the young Takawan, uh, religious study uh, was, was his devotion uh, at this early state. And we see that he entered the Rinzai school of Zen at age 14. So uh, not, not much later than uh, when he first began, he entered the Rinzai school, which would be his uh, personal study, his, his religion, his philosophy, uh, till the day he died. And to have picked that craft up at age 14 um, shows incredible devotion that uh, he believes so much in it that uh, despite going from age 14 to 24 to 34 to 44, through these decades, uh, he still maintained this philosophy and became uh, quite a well-respected teacher uh, and minister uh, of Zen Buddhism. But uh, not all people agreed with him. Not all people uh, saw him as this, uh, this great figure in feudal Japan. And he was actually banished in 1629 uh, to northern Japan. Uh, that was where he was exiled. And this was uh, the shogun uh, of the Tokugawa Hidetada. And it's believed that this was uh, a political um, banishment, that it was nothing that he d had done personally other than uh, this particular shogun uh, in Hidetada thought that uh, uh, religious figures uh, such as Takawan were involving themselves in court politics a little too much to his liking. So he was starting to banish people. And as we remember from the Stoicism series, this was not unlike uh, Emperor Domitian uh, banishing philosophers from Rome because he was seeing them as troublesome uh, and stirring up trouble uh, among the people, and uh, in particular in the political class. But uh, he had friends in high places, which 
was good for him and good for the world because it, it gave us uh, Taco and Soho, uh, the thinker and the writer, back to the world. And he was recalled in 1632 by Shogun of the Tokugawa Imitsu. So after Tokugawa Hidetada had been removed by the emperor, uh, the Tokugawa um, emperor, um, the dynasty, uh, employed uh, the Shogun Imitsu. And Imitsu uh, was a, a different Shogun in that he regarded Takawan and his teachings as extremely vital uh, to, the, uh, to the empire and feudal Japan, and that uh, such a man was uh, needed close to Edo. And he uh, recalled uh, Takawan to be the first abbot of a temple in Edo that he built explicitly for Takawan Soho to teach Zen Buddhism and to be a counsel to the shogun and the emperor if he was called upon uh, uh, for his advice. And it's incredible to go from three years of banishment in northern Japan, but to be recalled later and uh, move to this very high position. But it's suspected that his friend and uh, samurai, uh, who we'll get to in the next uh, part of the series, Yagyu Munonori, uh, this may have been his doing. He may have intervened uh, in uh, the court of Tokugawa Imitsu and lobbied on uh, the recall of Takawan. Uh, that he had asked for his friend, his men, one of his mentors and contemporaries uh, to be returned to the city, to be returned to regular uh, life in Japan because he was so valuable. So we have uh, Takawan to thank for the unfettered mind and we have Munonori to thank uh, also for the unfettered mind because it's possible that Takawan may have never dedicated uh, these works to his friend Munonori had he never been able to uh, return uh, to public service uh, in this temple in Edo. Okay, but uh, moving now to the unfettered mind itself, we see that the third chapter of the book, the final chapter, is are the Annals of the Sword Tai. And as I mentioned uh, a minute or two ago, uh, the Sword Tai was a, a euphemism for the mind, the conscience. And uh, the Sword of Tai is something that every man, as Takwan says, um, is, is born with. Uh, this is something you wield uh, as you do a weapon. The mind, the conscience, is something that uh, every man has. And depending on how they choose to better their craft at wielding this sword, uh, the more powerful it becomes. And he says that every man is born with the ability to wield the sword tie, and if he so chooses, neither heaven nor earth can break this sword or parry it. It becomes something that transcends uh, him, something that transcends life on earth and even in the heavens. It is the consciousness that goes beyond these things that the sword that each individual carries as the sword tie uh, is something that if the individual who holds it chooses can be so indestructible, so quick and so um, technical that even heaven and earth uh, are beneath it. And it's hard to imagine that you say, well, how can a, a, a person have an individual conscience, a mind that could be both um, above heaven and earth, but still of the earthly realm? And that's, that's the, the mystery of the sword tie is that it is something that everyone carries here in the earthly realm, but that comes from a celestial plane beyond heaven and beyond earth. Uh, this is the, um, the mystery of the soul. Uh, the soul is both uh, corporal in my body, but it is also celestial uh, with, uh, outside of the body that it occupies. So we'll read now from uh, the Annals of the Sword Tai, and we'll uh, discuss some of the excerpts and what he meant um, in regards to this, this weapon that you can wield and each man wields as a sword in his own life. And I'll again, I will provide the read along with the unfettered mind so that you can follow. We jump right into it. We go to page 84. And Takawan says, Martial artist is as the characters indicate. Not to fight for gain or loss, not to be concerned with strength or weakness, means not vying for victory or worrying about defeat, and not being concerned with the functions of strength or weakness. Neither advance a step nor retreat a step means taking neither one step forward 
nor one step to the rear. Victory is gained without stirring from where you are. The me of the enemy does not see me refers to my true self. It does not mean my perceived self. People can easily see the perceived self. It is rare for them to discern the true self. Thus I say the enemy does not see me. I do not see the enemy because I do not take the personal view of the perceived self. I do not see the martial art of the enemy's perceived self. Although I say I do not see the enemy, this does not mean I do not see the enemy right before my very eyes. To be able to see the one without seeing the other is a singular thing. Well then, the true self is the self that existed before the division of heaven and earth and before one's father and mother were born. This self is the self within me, the birds and the beasts, the grasses and the trees, and all phenomena. It is exactly what is called the Buddha nature. All right. So, uh, if you've never read a passage on Zen Buddhism, uh, you just did. That, that, is, um, that is very Zen. Uh, that, that, that two or three paragraphs, I think, incorporates the, um, the puzzling nature of understanding Zen Buddhism, but also understanding that Zen, I believe Zen Buddhism itself does not pretend as though it has all these answers. It just knows that uh, certain pieces that are given to us as human beings with our mind and our soul and our body, uh, these, are the, these are the ways in which they must operate. Uh, and I think he says that much in this passage that there is the self and there is the true self. There is your body, there is your martial artist body, as he explains to Yagyu, his his samurai friend, and there is your true self. There is your sword, your mind, your conscience, your, your soul. This is the true self. And I can see my opponent in front of me, and he can see me, but he does not see the true me. And this true essence of who you are existed before the divisions of heaven and earth, before your father met your mother, or your grandfather met your grandmother. Uh, this, this soul that possesses you, that you carry with you, is not unlike what the Stoics would say, that we are but corpses carrying around a soul. And this soul is the manifestation of heaven and earth within us that gives our lives uh, activity, uh, that, that generates these thoughts of right and wrong, of virtue, of vice. And uh, to see one's true self uh, is the most difficult thing you can do as a human being because it, it requires you to disregard everything your senses take in, but to think more upon what is only perceived by the mind apart from the senses. And this is, a very, this is almost impossible for the average person to do because to separate your mind from your senses, it's, um, it's almost like separating a engine from an automobile, right? So the engine is what drives the car, but we would say, well, without the car, the engine is useless. Without the engine, the car is useless. But the engine is what gives the car purpose uh, in the first place. Because if, if the engine is useless without the car, well, the engine can be put into something else and put to a different uh, means of locomotion. You can retrofit engines to do different things, but a car is just a shell. It is the corpse carrying around that, that essence, that engine. Um, so to separate your mind from your body and see the true self is to separate the engine from the car, to the, from the automobile, and to understand that the complexity of the engine is what gives meaning to the vehicle. And that's and the purpose for which we use it, which is driving around to, to go places and to see things and to pick things up. Uh, that, was, that was the sword tie. This was the engine uh, within your vehicle. And to see the true self uh, was using your mind to decipher what your mind perceives and what your mind is in tune with and not letting your senses overcome what your mind is able to deduce if it takes the time, this reflection through meditation, this zazen, uh, and, and gives thought to. Okay, I hope I 
did a decent job of describing that. Um, and in another way, this is uh, akin to saying uh, something that we, we see throughout the world but feel intrinsically, uh, you could say, is similar to how the, the Jedi in the Star Wars universe uh, is in tune with the Force. That these things that are beyond us, but these things that we are aware of, are the things that bind all life together. And that the Force is, in a sense, a sword tie uh, in the science fiction realm. I thought that was worth mentioning, too. Okay, we'll go to reading number two in a GIF here. And it's on the same page. And Takawan uh, says in this passage, quote, The ordinary man has no strength of faith and does not know the persistence of even three or five years. But those who study the way are absolutely diligent for 10 to 20 years, 24 hours a day. They muster up great strength of faith, speak with those who have wisdom, and disregard adversity and suffering. Like a parent who has lost a child, they do not retreat a scintilla from their established resolu resolution. They think deeply, adding inquiry to inquiry. In the end, they arrive at the place where even Buddhist doctrine and Buddhist law melt away and are naturally able to see this. Penetrating to a place where heaven and earth have not yet divided, where yin and yang have not yet arrived, I quickly and necessarily gain effect means to set one's eye on the place that existed before heaven became heaven and earth became earth, before yin and yang came into being. It is to use neither thought nor reasoning and to look straight ahead. In this way, the time of gaining great effect will surely arrive. So again, <laughs> um, this, yeah, this passage is, is very Zen, it's very Zen Buddhist thought in that, uh, to have sight beyond that which is sight, to have hearing which is beyond sound, to have feeling that which is beyond the ability of touch, uh, to have understanding that which is beyond comprehension. This is, this is the way in which the Buddhist, the, the Zen Buddhist monk must approach his perceptions of reality, his understandings of truth, uh, just the same as a warrior walking the path of Bushido must look at every challenge or every truth he is quote-unquote faced with in life. He must learn to live beyond that which can be seen, that which can be known, that which can be felt, that which can be understood. It is, it is a difficult thing to achieve this state, this enlightenment, but is what we all must strive for if we are to hone our consciousness, if we are to wield the sword tie so that the conscious mind can be broken by neither heaven nor uh, our earth. Okay, last reading. And this one speaks exactly uh, to the um, imagery of the sword tie itself. And he says, that's on page 92. All men are equipped with this sharp, sharp sword tie, and in each one it is perfectly complete. This means that the famous sword tie, which no blade under heaven can parry, is not imparted just to other men. Everyone, without exception, is equipped with it. It is adequate for no one, and it is perfectly entire. They're inadequate for no one, and it is perfectly entire. Uh, this is a matter of the mind. This mind was not born with your birth and will not die with your death. This being true, it is said to be your original face. Heaven is not able to cover it. Earth is not able to support it. Fire is not able to burn it, nor is water able to dampen it. Even the wind is unable to penetrate it. There is nothing under heaven that is able to obstruct it. Okay. Yeah. So even I had to, I, I stumbled over the reading there because it's, you're trying to parse out what's being said here and, and make sense of it as you read. It's, it's difficult to do these things. It almost seems like um, the, these are um, like idiosyncrasies within riddles, and the riddles are within parables and proverbs, which they sort of are. But what he's saying, uh, if, if I'm not incorrect, which I very well could be, is that the sword tie that every man has is perfect in and of itself, 
in that if you have reason, if you have a mind and you have consciousness and you can perceive the world, your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, uh, your aversions, then you can, you can wield this blade because it is uh, perfect in its entirety. It is not inadequate. And that uh, neither fire can burn nor water can dampen or wind cannot penetrate. Uh, it is something that uh, is, is above these elements of earth. Uh, because it was there before the earth was conceived, uh, just as it was there before uh, the heavens and the earth split into two different realms. Um, to have this mind of the sword tie is to rise above uh, things which you know and things which you perceive uh, so that you can achieve greater consciousness about things that perhaps never have been or things that have, are yet to be uh, conceived in the conscious mind. And if you can move beyond the world that we are taught, the world that we know, and the world that we are uh, raised uh, either through tradition, education, or through uh, the religion of Rinzai, this is to be of the Buddha mind, that, that to, to see things beyond that which is within our comprehension to see. This is the process of enlightenment which is why it's so difficult to attain. But he says uh, that the samurai as the Zen Buddhist monk uh, is, is walking through their lives in their individual paths, be it uh, Rinzai or be it Bushido. Uh, they carry the sword Thai with them. And it is a sword that is perfect in and of itself. Uh, but the master, uh, the student, uh, the trainer who picks up this sword must learn to wield it, uh, and as they go through the course of their life, be it from 10 years old to 14 years old to their death, uh, they must never cease to use the sword tie as their mind and conscience uh, in the world because once they understand that this weapon that they carry is unbreakable and cannot be uh, burned by fire or penetrated by the wind or broken by heaven or earth, they will move with it closer towards enlightenment and a more perfect state of consciousness. Okay, yeah, it's confusing, I know. Uh, <laughs> there, there's so much more to go into as far as Zen Buddhism and Takawan Soho's readings. Like, the more you read it, uh, you think that you're getting closer to the deeper meaning, but it's almost like walking into a, uh, a forest and thinking that you've found the way out and you only find that you've walked into deeper forest. Um, but I guess this is, this is the path of trying to decipher Zen Buddhism. And uh, it's good. It, it definitely, it, it trains your mind to never get used to thinking it knows what's up. It, it can, it can dis, uh, decipher what's being said and it knows where this plot's going uh, because uh, that is life. We always think we know where we're going. We always think we know that we're wiser than we were the day before. But that's the um, uh, enigma of wisdom is that the more you uh, achieve, uh, the greater wisdom you attain, the more you realize, as Socrates says, how, how little you truly know about the world and about uh, existence. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll move on from more of the uh, theoretical and uh, esoteric knowledge of Bushido and Zen Buddhism. And as I said, we'll move into the works of the actual samurai and we'll, we'll move to uh, the uh, works of Yagyu Munanori, famous uh, swordsman and samurai in feudal Japan, a friend and um, a confidant of Taco and Soho. And we'll begin the next segment with his work, The Life-Giving Sword. Uh, anyway, I uh, hope you uh, are enjoying this series on uh, samurai literature and Bushido as much as I am. Uh, if so, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're liking the channel, again, please subscribe. Share it with friends or family, anyone you think might be interested in this, uh, this material, this, this philosophy. And we will see you in the next one, beginning with part one of Yagi Munanori. Till then, take it easy.